Hello, welcome back to the evening read aloud of Black Beauty by Anne Sewell. I'm continuing on to chapter 17. Last chapter ended sadly with the fire. And now we are on the rest of the journey and it's called John Manley's Talk, chapter 17. The rest of our journey was very easy and a little after sunset, we reached the house of my masters. Friend, we were taken into a clean, snug stable. There was a kind coachman who made us very comfortable and who seemed to think, and seemed to think a good deal of James when he heard about the fire. There is one thing quite clear, young man, he said. Your horses know who they can trust. It is one of the hardest things in the world to get a horse out of a stable when there's either a fire or a flood. I don't know why they don't come out, but they won't. Not in 20. We stopped two or three days at this place and then returned home. All went well on our journey. We were glad to be in our own stable again, and John was quite equally glad to see us. Before he and James left us for the night, James said, I wonder who is coming in my place. Little Joe Green at the lodge, said John. Little Joe Green? while well, he's a child. He's fourteen and a half, said John. But he's such a little chap. Yes, he is small, but he is quick and willing and very kind-hearted, too. And when he wishes very much to come, and his father would like it. And I know the master would like to give him the chance. He said if I thought he would do, would not do, he would look out for a bigger boy. But I said I was quite, a, I was quite agreeable to try him for six weeks. Six weeks, said James. Why, it will be six months before we can get much, he can be of much use. It will make you a great deal of work, John. Well, said John with a laugh, work and I are very good friends. I was never afraid of work yet. You are a good man, John James. I wish I may ever be like you. I don't often speak of myself, said John, but as you are going away from us out into the world to shift to shift for yourself, I'll just tell you how I look on these things. I was just as old as Joseph when my father and mother died of the fever within ten days of each other and left me and my crippled sister Nellie alone in the world without a relation that we could look to for help. I was a farmer's boy and not earning enough to keep myself, much less both of us. And she must have gone to the workhouse, but for a mistress, Nellie calls her angel, and she has good right to do so. She went and hired a room for her with old widow Mallet and she gave her knitting and needlework when she was able to do it. And when she was ill, she sent her dinners and many nice comfortable things and was like her mother too. When the master, he took me into the stable under old Norman, the coachman that was then, I had my food at the house and my bed in the loft and a suit of clothes and three shillings a week so that I could help Nellie. Then there was Norman. He might have turned around and said at his age he could not be troubled with a raw boy from the plow tail, but he was like a father to me and took no end of pain with me. When an old man, when the old man died some years after, I stepped into his place, and now, of course, I have top wages and can lay by for a rainy day or a sunny day, as it may happen, and Nellie is happy as a bird. So you see, James, I am not the man that should turn up his nose at a little boy and vex a good thing, kind master. No, no, I shall miss you very much, James, but 
we shall pull through and there's nothing like doing kindness when tis put in your way and I am glad to do it. <laughs> then said James, you don't hold with that saying everybody look after themselves and take good care of number one. No, indeed, said John. Where should I and Nellie have been if master and mistress and old Norman had only taken care of number one? Why, she in the workhouse and I hoeing turnips? Where would Black Beauty and Ginger have been if you had only thought of number one? Why, I'm roasted to death. No, Jim, no. That is a selfish, heedless thing to say, whatever uses it. And any man who thinks he has nothing to do but take care of number one, why, it's a pity. But what he had what he had been drowned like a puppy or a kitten before he had gotten his eyes open? That's what I think, said John, with a very decided jerk of his head. James laughed at this, but there was a thickness in his voice when he said, You have been my best friend except for my mother, and I hope you won't forget it, and you won't forget me. No, lad, no, said John, and if I ever can do you a good turn, I hope you won't forget me. The next day, Joe came to the stable to learn all he could from James before he left. He learned to sweep the stable, to bring in the straw and hay. He began to clean the harnesses and help to wash the carriages. As he was quiet, as as he was quite, quite too short to do anything in the way of grooming Ginger and me, James taught him upon merry legs, for he was to have full charge of him under John. He was a nice, bright fellow and always came whistling to work. Merry legs was a good deal put out at being mauled about, as he said, by a boy who knew nothing but towards the end of the second week, he told me confidently that he thought the boy would turn out well. At last the day came when James had to leave us. Cheerful as he was, he looked quite downhearted that morning. You see, he said to John, I'm leaving a great deal behind. My mother and Betsy and you and a good master and mistress, and then the horses, and my old merry legs. At the new place, there will not be a soul that I know. If there, if it were not that I shall get a higher place and be able to help my mother better, I don't think I should have made up my mind to do it. It is a real pinch, John. I... James, lad, so it is, but I should not think much of you if you could leave your home for the first time and not feel it. Cheer up. You'll make friends there, and if you get on well, as I'm sure you will, it will be a fine thing for your mother, and she will be proud enough that you have got into such a good place as that. So John cheered up cheered him up, but everyone was sorry to lose James. As for Merrylegs, he pined after him for several days and went quite off his appetite. So John took him out several mornings with a leading rein, and when he exercised me and trotting and galloping by my side, got up the little fellow's spirit again and he was soon all right. Joe's father would often come in and give a little help as he understood the work, and Joe took a great deal of pain to learn, and John was quite encouraged about him. All right, see you next time. Thanks for joining me.